Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our inspiring content. Here is episode 148. They can figure out how to get it and where to go to learn it, that they can find their own mentors instead of just, I'm just going to sit here and wait for the right thing to come along. It's something you have to go out and get. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Daniela Larson, and she is from Nivanas.com, which I'm excited to talk about this online program that she has started. But before we get into any of that, can you briefly tell our audience a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me on. It's been a journey getting to where I am now. I'm not sure where I will end up, but I'm a homeschooling mom that has homeschooled for about 17 years Wow. and five kids and have really seen education change throughout that time. And it's amazing the resources and the access to both online education and mentors that kids have, you know, because of just how the world is changing and the internet and things like that. I used to, and I I still do, we run a nonprofit where we work a lot in economic development in mostly in Madagascar and Nepal and a few other places. And as kids got older and we started seeing how well a lot of these things were working in other countries, we decided, why don't we try, you know, something like that here and got involved with the state in identifying trainings that people were lacking to actually get either employed or be able to work independently on their own because there's a lot of work that is available for people to do from home for legitimate companies when it comes to website building and social media marketing and a lot of those sorts of things. And so... We've been working with the state here to create a lot of those trainings. So we have two sides. We've got the Navanis World School, which is where we have a lot of high school courses, and then Navanis Institute, where we have adult certifications and courses. As far as hobbies and passions, things like that, about me, just I just wanted to, as a young mom, I just wanted to see the world with my kids. There was nothing funner than just exploring nature, exploring different cultures. And so very young, we started traveling with our family and being able to have a few classes that they could keep up with as we would go and visit different places. Just made it feel so we didn't have like a huge, huge interruption in what they were doing. And it just gave us the freedom to do school from wherever we wanted and to be able to connect with whatever mentors we wanted. It's been amazing how accessible some of the people that you would think are like world-renowned experts in marine biology or paleontology, which are or falconry, some of the interests that my kids have had. They're happy to talk to your kids and to point them in the right direction. And so, you know, exploring those things has been a lot of fun. As far as what is really satisfying and is my personal paycheck, economic development has been huge. I've worked in some other countries, as I mentioned before, but then also here in the U.S. where just a very few marketable skills will take somebody from being on welfare to being self-reliant. And seeing families make that transition by going through our program, that's a huge paycheck for me. It's very satisfying and fulfilling. We work with a lot of stay-at-home moms. You know, people have recently gone through divorce. A lot of times people have been working at an insurance agency for 20 years and all of a sudden they're downsizing. They don't need to go back and get another degree. They just need some marketable skills pretty quickly. So that's kind of like the evolution that things have taken. My kids are older now. My youngest is 11 and my oldest is 21. It's been fun as I have worked and really developed my career that it's At first, I felt a little guilty that I was maybe neglecting them or something, but because I I have a home office where, unless we're recording some education in the studio, I work from my home office, they have really flourished with me just getting out of their way. 
they really didn't need me to set up all their little assignments and daily activities and things like that. So it's been an interesting evolution to see how differently I do things with my fifth child than when I did with my first. <laughs> but me being busy has been a big part of that. Well, and it, it sounds like, though, that you are using your business as a benefit to your own family. I mean, correct? I mean, you're also being a mentor to your own children about, you know, being able to be a successful person in the world as well as there to teach them. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, just kind of leading by example and having them see how when you need to learn something, you just have to go find out where that information is and buckle down and learn it. You're not going to be tested on it. You just need to be able to show that you can do it. So one of the things that we do with our kids is they all build their own WordPress sites, their own online portfolios that they can use for college entrance or getting a job or access to, you know, two different things. And so they're getting a lot of really great marketable skills while they're, you know, starting really young, like around, you know, 12 or so is when they start building out their own websites and start listing the books that they're reading. And, and we've always done instead of this what happened in the book have them write about how this book changed me as part of you know their portfolio and with that it's been amazing the doors that it's opened for college and scholarships because they have an online presence they look different than just a regular college application yeah look more like a person of value versus uh, just an average person correct Well, it's not even like average kids, but like the best performing kids. So you can have a 4.0 GPA and you can have really great scores on your ACTs and you've done all these extracurricular activities. And so do the 800 other people that are applying for that spot in college. So it really has been a way to really differentiate themselves because they're three dimensional as opposed to just something in black and white on a piece of paper on a college application. So it's Yeah, it's been helpful for them that way. That's great. So tell me, I mean, it sounds like when you first started, let's hear the whole story. You know, you first started as just a regular homeschooling mom that wanted to be there for her own children. And this has kind of moved into you creating, you know, moving that technology along. You talked about earlier the advances and you're part of that, right? I mean, tell us about that story and how you found your mission and your passion for the things that you love to do. Well, I think mission is an always evolving thing. It's not oftentimes what we think it is. And I think a lot of times, you know, when if this crowd is familiar with the whole hero cycle thing, everybody's always talking about, you know, the hero in it. But the the one place that gets a little bit neglected that is a very, very powerful place to be is the mentor that you meet along the way, you know. And it's been interesting as I've had the opportunity to be that, I think, a lot more times. I worry about that role a lot more than I worry about, you know, being the hero in, in the cycle. We never thought we'd homeschool. I thought that was just something really strange people did. And we didn't know anybody that homeschooled at the time. When my son that is now 18 started kindergarten, he had a very bad speech impediment. He'd been very sick as an infant, hadn't developed properly with his tongue, some the motor skills that you need to learn to read phonetically. And because of the medical trauma that he had been through, he had just developed the sweetest, most empathetic soul that you would ever want in a child just a great affinity for animals couldn't stand to see anything suffer he's my falconer now that takes in you know injured birds of prey and and just you know healthy birds of prey is just really involved with animals and stuff but I saw very quickly when he went to school how all of a sudden his whole self-image was a reflection of my teacher thinks I'm stupid the teacher just humiliated him. He started stuttering. He started having all sorts of other problems and just seeing how his self-worth just plummeted because he could not say certain sounds that, you know, as a mother, you get your mama bear up and you're like, heck no, not my child. Nobody's going to make him feel dumb when he is, he's brilliant. He just has this one disability. So we tried getting him into speech pathology in the school and they you had to score in the ninth percentile and he scored like one above that. And so they wouldn't give him any services. So we pulled him out and started doing speech therapy full time and just started working with him on, we weren't going to worry about school. We were just going to just like read a lot, hang out at the library and at the museums and 
pretty soon we were having so much fun that the older child was like, well, can I come home too? And so we started doing some traveling and spending a lot of time in museums. And by this time, my husband and I were running a nonprofit and the kids were getting really involved in that. And we could really see the difference that it made on them to feel like they were making a difference, that they were actually making a contribution. And it changed the conversation in our family very quickly to not what is it that you want to be when you grow up, but what contribution do you want to make when you grow up? Sometimes it's not an orphanage in Africa or something. Sometimes I just want to, I want to sing. I want to create beautiful music. I want to create beautiful art. And then what are the skills that you need to acquire to be able to make that contribution? And that's what your education plan is. And that's just how every year has evolved. We reassess that, make sure that the kids have access to the mentors that will help them get the skills that they need for that. Well, it sounds like you kind of had an unschooling approach, too, where you just allowed the learning to happen organically, that you didn't have like a set curriculum necessarily, but really focused on the things that the kids loved and then took them to those. Is that correct? Am I painting the correct picture? Of, yes. Of your education? And I, I've never called it unschooling just because we do have quite a bit of structure and we do require certain things, but very little. Like we talk about, we have the conversation about what a mentor is. And then we love to watch the scene in The Karate Kid about, you know, painting the fence and waxing the floor, wax on, wax off, which is a really, really great clip to talk to kids about what mentoring is. Because when you want somebody to teach you something and when you say, I want my contribution to be saving the whales or whatever it is that you want to be. Well, if you don't have an online presence and a voice and a following, nobody's going to hear whatever message that you have. And so to be able to develop a website, these are the skills that you're going to need. You're going to need to learn how to write. You're going to need to learn WordPress. You're going to need to learn some of these things. But sometimes you get into learning writing and it's not fun and it's hard. But we're like, we require that once you've committed to learning a skill, then the, you know, they commit a certain amount of time a day to work on that skill. So it's not a complete unschooling approach, but it's very eclectic depending on what time of the year it is and what they want to learn at that certain time. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. I like the idea of making them stick with it for a certain amount of time because uh, too many times we want, you know, allow our children to give up before they're, you know, really at a place of seeing that advanced skill develop you know, where they want to give up and not really focus on having what is it grit that they stick with. That. Exactly. Right. And we used to just call that tenacity and, you know, grit kind of like the new buzzword. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's really a lot of it has to do with tenacity and just sticking with something because every project, everything that you decide to learn is always fun and exciting at first. And then you hit this wall where it's hard and it's not fun and you don't want to do it anymore. And it really helps me even as an adult, but it helps them to have somebody that you're accountable to that, no, I committed, I would spend this much time on it every day and I would work towards acquiring these skills. And also somebody that you just trust, just kind of the, the whole, you know, paint the fence scene. You don't get why you need to know this, but trust me, you need to get this skill down. You need to learn handwriting. You know, you need to learn to type, even though it doesn't seem fun now. It's really hard to do any kind of social media marketing or anything like that when you're just pecking on your keyboard because you don't know how to type. Well, you really finish the goal setting structure of helping mm -hmm. them set the goal and then having them stick with that. That's great. <laughs> So tell me, what do you feel like, we've kind of already discussed it, but the inspiration behind your nonprofit and trying to start Nevada's? You know, you know mostly the, the nonprofit, we'd had a couple that had come over and told us about a time that they'd spent serving a mission in Madagascar. The kids wanted to do something to help. And so at first we started just doing a few things, like the kids would raise money to uh, get a rickshaw for a family or chickens for a family. And yet very quickly, we, we realized that a lot of these traditional programs, they really build dependence instead of independence. People are really tied into you, and we really wanted to see what we could do to have people be completely self-reliant, leave the program, and be out you know, on their own. And we started noticing very quickly just the huge impact it was having on them and the kind of people that they were becoming by feeling like they were making a contribution, like them being alive was making the world a better place because of things that they were doing. And some more people started, you know, getting involved and things like that just sometimes snowball. 
and that did. The nonprofit is Small Candle, and the tagline for that is is that it's better to, to light one small candle than to curse all the darkness. Mm-hmm. I had loved a quote that I had read by Mother Teresa where she was talking about how she would go to a pro-peace rally, but she wouldn't go to an anti-war rally. She would be pro a lot of things, but let's not waste our energy being anti-things. And there's so much of complaining about what's wrong with politics and the world and poverty and just everything that we see right around us that can either use the energy that you have to complain about it or to just do something about it, even if it's very little. And it matters. Even if it's very little, it matters to the one or two people that are impacted by that. So that was the genesis of that. And it's, you know, it's been around for probably 15 years or so now. And it's given us some great opportunities to travel and see other parts of the world and really, really appreciate the opportunities that we have here, but also see how close to us poverty is. You don't need to go to Madagascar to work in economic development. There's a lot of work to be done right here and how important it is for us because we're huge on doing it like in other countries and we're really big on like the liberal arts here in teaching our kids. We, you know, read a, a ton, they read a ton, but what are you going to be able to also be economically independent with that you can do? Because so many times we tell our kids just to, I don't know if you've seen that awesome little clip with Mike Rowe on Prager University where he's talking about don't follow your dream. Have you seen that? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true where we talk to kids so much about follow your passion. You can do anything that you want, but then you're still living in your parents' basement when you're 35 because that perfect opportunity hasn't come. But if you follow the opportunity and bring your passion, like he talks about, you need to make sure that you're going to be able to take care of yourself economically and family. We, find we, ways to serve your community. You know, the guy who's cleaning out the right. toilets or the septic tank or whatever, he wouldn't necessarily, that wouldn't be his, like his dream job that he grew up to do, but he found a way he can serve other people and right. was passionate about that. Right. Mike Rose, one of my favorites. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go back to the tenacity and the grit discussion that we were having. What do you feel like some challenges that you've had along the way are? And what do you feel like you've learned from those? Well, me, personal challenges, and then also I'll talk a little bit about what we have kind of found is like the best way to to really teach some of those things. You know, just with five little kids, three in diapers at once, there's not much that takes more tenacity than that. (laughs) You just have to keep getting up and homeschooling, especially when your kids are little. It's hard. It's a lot of fun and the payoffs are amazing, but sticking to it, even when it's gets hard that really tried my endurance starting a business has been you know really big there's been a lot of times where you want to quit or you don't think things are going to work out but things always do there's you know just health issues and and just a lot of things that a lot of people face every day of your life takes some tenacity there's things that you don't feel like doing every day But one thing that has been really critical and a book that I would recommend to everybody is the book Essentialism. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yes. Taking that approach to your whole life and to homeschooling in general, really deciding what is essential to learn and essential to do and cutting everything else out and having absolutely no guilt about that and really knowing that whatever you say no to, you're getting to say yes to what is essential to you. And making sure that you're not glorifying busy. We glorify busy so much. It's almost like a badge of honor for some people how busy they are. That really just means that you can't delegate or manage your time very well if you're doing more than you can do. So I I think sometimes what we think of, like, you just need to stick to it and stick to it. Make sure that it's something that you really need to stick to. It could be something that you don't. And we decided very early when we had a few of our kids in soccer, that wasn't something that we wanted to dedicate every weekend of our lives to and cut that out. And it frees time up for other things. As far as teaching that, because I think that is one of the things that we've identified as essential to teach our children, tenacity and grit, those sorts of things. Nothing teaches it better than stories, biographies, historical fiction, even the stories of people that you know, because you never read, 
you never read a really great book about somebody that got up and had a bunch of dreams and they went out that day and everything worked out great and they accomplished everything that they wanted to. And I grew up in Canada. One of our favorites is the story of Terry Fox. For your listeners who don't know who he is, you know, back in the 80s, he lost a leg to cancer and after going through a lot, decided to run across Canada to raise money for cancer awareness. And uh, particularly one of my kids, he just really latched onto that story. And for Halloween, he was Terry Fox. He had a tinfoil wrapped around his leg. Nobody could figure out who he was. (laughs) But just being around a lot of those stories, it's not something you can be tested on. It's just something that that you pick up and you find that you respect people that don't quit and just, you know, really keep going. Yeah. Well, and I kind of want to go back to the essentialism discussion that we were having. I think many times as homeschoolers, we project onto ourselves what we grew up with in our education, you know, what those teachers behind us thought, or or maybe we project and try to do our schooling like what we think society thinks that we should be doing for our schooling. And that is really important for us to think about you know, what are those essential things that we want our children to come away with from our school and really focus on those things that maybe you feel more inspired to direct them versus, you know, what's going on around us or who we think everyone else thinks we should be. What would you say to that with your essentialism? I I don't know that I could say it any better than you said it exactly. Decide what is essential for your children to leave your home environment with and as you're sending them out into the world. For us, it's been things is like, How do we talk to ourselves? What's the internal conversation that determines so much of the level of happiness in your life? That's a really critical thing. Financial management, learning how to handle money, understanding how interest works, learning how to cook, being able to understand nutrition, all the things that you need to be a successful adult. How does the election process work? A lot of the things that come in curriculum, a lot of things that kids spend a ton of time even in really great workbooks, you know, filling out pages, hours and hours, days, years are consumed with Have really no, irrelevant yeah. information. They can fill in a blank, but that is not a skill that is really needed. One question that, that I like to ask them a lot and that we've used a lot is, how can I make it better? As an employer, now that I have a business and have to hire people, People used to talk about how problem solving was like such a great skill. And I've really come to the conclusion that it's not problem solving that matters. It's problem identifying, figuring out what is the problem? How can you make this situation better and working towards that? Because it's very simple for somebody to get a worksheet or something and solve the problem that is put in front of them. But in life and in business and in economic development, Oftentimes, the problem is not what you think it is. The problem is way further up the chain and identifying it and making sure that you're working on the right problem instead of whatever Band-Aid there is at the end. It might be you need to change your nutrition instead of just getting new, you know, new medication. But to, to carry that concept a little bit further, one of the projects that our nonprofit is involved in quite a bit is uh, human trafficking and it's interesting. We've worked with several organizations, with OUR, with the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, with a lot of these different organizations that work in child trafficking. And it's not that we just need to go out and arrest all of the people that are trafficking children. That's helpful, and there's a place for that, definitely. But it's a lack of economic opportunity for yes, women. I was going to say that. It, that they end up right. in really bad situations because they're looking for a way to support themselves or whatever, or their family's looking for a way to feed the family, you know, and so then they, anyway, you probably know, you know way more about it. Well, I think we're, we're all familiar, for example, one story that we can relate to a little bit is, even though it's fiction, is Les Mis and the judgment that we passed on Cosette's mother on, um, oh my goodness, her name just slipped my mind, it's not Eponine. But the the other character who basically goes into prostitution to take care of her child, none of us judge her for that. You know, I think a lot of us as mothers really stand back and think, what wouldn't I do to feed my child? And the huge sacrifices that are made. And 
it's in so many places, it's just because there is no other way to feed your child that they get into these situations. And so working on the economic development in places like Nepal, where it's a huge problem, where child trafficking is a huge problem, that actually does a lot more to benefit the problem than just trying to get the brothel closed down. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Changing a paradigm takes some study, but like me, you are probably super busy. That's why we've teamed up with Audible. Go to our website, theluminousvine.net, get a free month of Audible with two audiobooks, thousands of titles in exchange for only books that you absolutely love. You too can be learning on the go to keep that fire burning. Mind with Daniela Larson, helping to bring you the world's best mentors. Let's talk about how you identified some problems and see how Nivanis is maybe different educational online platform than the norm. It sounds like, you know, you really have a heart for providing people with actual skills that they can use. Tell me a little bit more about those services. Yeah, so we've got two sites. We've got Nivanis World School, and that website is ws.nivanis.com. And we, we have a full production studio, and we record a lot of education and distribute it for people that just can't get out there and give the same speeches over and over. Elizabeth Smart came in and did a positive psychology class. Dinesh D'Souza came in and did a, a political science class. Uh, several other people, we've got probably like 16 different classes, including some technology classes, WordPress and social media marketing and things like that on the high school side. If students are enrolled in anything like Harmony or Lumen or My Tech High, all of those online charter school options pay for our classes. In other states, oftentimes if parents just request them through if they're using an online charter school option to help pay or facilitate for any of their homeschooling stuff, they'll just request us to be a vendor and then the, the school will cover our classes as well. Although majority of our students are just, you know, paying for a certain classes themselves. On the adult side, on the Nivanis.com side, this, that whole problem of economic development and opportunities here in Utah where I live We've got a lot of companies. The Lehigh area has been called Silicon Slope. There's a lot of development, but there's not enough people to fill the jobs. They don't need people with computer science skills. Oftentimes, they just need somebody that knows WordPress and a little HTML and CSS, and then they can get you know placed into a job. But the especially our digital marketing program is the one that I really love because of the flexibility that it provides for moms, for a lot of homeschooling moms that take our class. Because once you learn how to put together a website on, on WordPress and you're building one or two of those a month and, you know, getting paid $2,500 per website, it makes a huge difference in the freedom that it gives you as a mother to do what you want to do and be able to be a lot more present for your kids I've decided it's not essential for me to be the one that goes out and does my grocery shopping. But because of the income that comes in from being able to do web development, sometimes just when we're watching a movie as a family together or, you know, most of it is just done at home at strange hours. It gives me the freedom to pay a nanny to go pick up all the groceries. And (laughs) I love this idea. (laughs) it, it, It frees you up because they're, Reading to a child and that bonding time that we have when we read together as a family, that's not something that I can outsource. No. I'm the only one that can do that. So Feelings really, that are created in that situation, you don't want to discount that because you've got to run off and do some mindless errand. That I mean, although grocery shopping is an important, you know, but it's not necessarily where you want to spend your resources, correct? Right. It's just one of those things that I try to automate as much as I can and pass everything off that doesn't require me to do it. And then I can have my time be dedicated to 
the essentials, that one-on-one time with kids, the traveling with family, you know, working on business development, things like that. And it, I think sometimes we just have to, you know, change our mindset because everything that we say yes to, we're saying no to something else. And we as women, we spend so much time doing things that can be automated, that can be done for us or that can be hired out. And we hesitate, a lot of times we hesitate to do that. We think we need to do it all ourselves and that's going to get us some kind of a badge somewhere. But you just have to decide what you're going to burn out on and what you're not and and be okay with it. Yeah. Well, and it it is a hard thing for a woman to decide to do because we do take a lot of pride in our homes and stuff. So with the school, Navanas, I mean, you've talked about the economically challenged type person. Are your classes, and we talked about earlier that it is a private institution, but at the same time, you can get public funding. Is it fairly inexpensive or do you focus on... I'm sorry, I'll, I'll let you finish your question. <laughs> well, you well, do you focus on the economically challenged and trying to make it, you know, affordable? We don't focus necessarily on the economically challenged. Our focus is more on, we just always want to have that available, the financial aid available for people that we don't want that to be an obstacle for somebody. So we partner with the Workforce Investment Act, and that is available in every state. And a lot of people qualify for that that don't even think that they qualify for that. Most stay-at-home moms qualify for grants. They're not loans, they're grants that the states have because our courses, the average is about $3,000. We have some that are like shorter that are just like learn WordPress or learn social media marketing that are $1,200. So they're very affordable and you come away with industry recognized certifications and you actually work for real businesses while you're in training. So you have work experience when you get out that makes it easier to get work on your own. But a lot of times people just want to do those because they have their own thing that they want to promote, but they need a website and it costs more than $3,000 oftentimes to pay somebody else to do it for you. And then you're kind of trapped with them because they're the only ones that can go in and change a date or, you know, different yeah. things like that. So learning that, just a lot of people just want to advance their skill. Most people don't use financial aid, but we have that available for those that need it. That's great. So tell me, I mean, we talked a little bit about you mentoring your children in different areas, but what mentors do you feel like you've had along the way that have made a significant difference in your success today? Uh, One that comes to mind right away is he's actually the director of the Natural History Museum here in Lehigh. His name's Ben Woodruff. My boys started helping him at Birds of Prey shows, oh, like, maybe 12 years ago, he would have them come and and they really appreciated this about him. Like before they could ever hold the birds or anything, they just had to go to the shows and, and clean up the poop if a bird pooped. He worked them hard. But as they kind of earned his respect and his trust and they've spent a lot of time just working and my husband says we should call it museum school, they've spent a lot of time just living and not living, but feels like living at the some of the natural history museums in the area, learning to teach other kids about, you know, paleontology and archaeology and things like that. It's Rick, I can't remember his last name. He's the head paleontologist at Thanksgiving Point Dinosaur Museum, has really taken one of my boys under his wing and he let him work in the lab with him for years. And that has turned into him wanting to take several paleontology courses online from the University of Alberta and go to big digs in Madagascar and, you know, be on other projects, coding. I mean, they, they all turn out so different. So my oldest is like a complete, like, techie coder, awesome, just can figure out anything when it comes to technology and coding. And then my second one is really not interested in any of that, even though he has learned how to build his own website so that he could, you know, have a voice about the things that he cares about. He wants to be outdoors and just all about nature and animals and things like that. For my older son, the technology one, people that were willing to give him a chance and give him some part-time work. And he was able to work at the space center and do a lot of programming and stuff for them here where they do a lot of space simulations and just, you know, they're, they're all stepping stones that lead to better and better jobs. But he was making more money what should have been his senior year of high school working for a company coding than a lot of people were making when they got out of college. So it's interesting 
when it comes to mentors because it seems like whenever a child has an interest, the right mentor just kind of shows up. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Every time if you're open to where's that opportunity and you're willing to follow that the opportunity and letting the passion come with it, there's so many opportunities there. Oh, I just love the way that you were able to access mentors to help your children learn. I mean, we kind of talked about that before, you know, really being open and looking at those directions to, you know, see which way your children's passions formed and allowing that to go. You know, you talked about your child uh, making more his senior year than most people did when they came out of college, but also what he's learning with the experience that he's gaining is just so beneficial as well. And he has, he still has a passion for his life, correct? Yeah, absolutely. There's still like a lot to learn. There's a lot of, you know, development that you're not sure exactly in which direction it's going to go or what other opportunity is going to present itself next. But he had done and we had been able to do together so much reading, so much discussing of events in history and being exposed to different cultures and different governments and things through travel that, you know, we felt like he was at a point where he was well-rounded enough where we could let him take a job where it should have been more his senior year that that experience was going to be more valuable. But he already had established that love of learning and the confidence, which is, I think, the biggest essential thing that they can take is the confidence that if there is a skill that they need or something that they want to know, they can figure out how to get it and where to go to learn it, that they can find their own mentors instead of just, I'm just going to sit here and wait for the right thing to come along. It's something you have to go out and get. Yeah. Well, and I think the comparison that I was trying to make is that sometimes when kids just stay in school, like if he would have gone to a high school with this goal of, you know, becoming a paleontologist or something like that, by the time they get through their schooling, the passion that they have for that's really zapped compared to a kid that's in it, learning it. And then I think his passion for it just grows. It doesn't, you know, it's not sucked out. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Because it's not, well, and not just that it sucked out, but, you know, you do paleontology in third grade, and then we don't talk about that anymore because we're on to, you know, to other things. And we've really tried to let our kids go deep instead of necessarily having to have a little bit of exposure to every single little thing when they get an interest to let them go as deep as they want into that. Well, that's great. So the next two questions that I have for you, I feel like we've kind of touched on them, but hopefully you'll either have something to add or find something new. But so what do you feel like the books that you've read, we talked about essentialism, that that was very influential. And you've talked about stories too, how important those are. Are there any other books that maybe you've read that you feel like have been really helpful to you? That's kind of a funny question. I am an audible junkie. I <laughs> listen to books on double C. I probably go through just, you know, driving or doing mundane tasks. I I probably go through one or two books a week. I love, love just books. Everything should be on Audible, right? (laughs) Yes. And I do still get a real hardback or paperback if it's one that I feel like I really want to go pull some quotes out of and stuff like that. But as far as books that have really impacted me this last year essentialism has been a big like paradigm shifter like you've said like you've talked about a lot of biographies and autobiographies and historical fiction I mean sometimes you just need something light but I have learned I love Regency novels and I have learned so much about just the suffrage movement and entailment and rights of, of women and without really understanding how all of that worked. You have no way to be so grateful for the way that things work now or why we should try so hard to preserve the freedoms and things that we have now. I think a lot of times we poo-poo fiction a little bit, but it really puts a lot of things in context around the, you know, Napoleonic Wars and things that were going on in, you know, Europe. And just, I, I love words. So there's, it just depends what, you know, what week it is. But well, as far as like some other big books, there was one book by Koki Roberts called Founding Mothers that really impacted me a lot when my children were young. I just remember that one standing out and it was the the stories of the wives and daughters of all the founding fathers and what their contributions were. 
And it just really helped me realize how important it is for mothers and women to really make a contribution, to not just be okay with not making a contribution, that we really have to invest in the society that we want our children to grow up in, and how much better society is for that women's involvement. Women are naturally a lot more compassionate and empathetic when it comes to even how we treat employees. It's been proven with a lot of studies that there's a lot that we have to contribute that sometimes we hold back on. Yeah, that maybe sometimes a lot of mothers don't recognize their own mission, you know, in life other than raising raising great kids, which is very important. But we also each have our own mission and that we shouldn't just rely on trying to help our maybe one of the best ways you can help your children find your mission is is actually living yours. I absolutely I I couldn't agree with you more. I think the mothers that I've seen completely self-sacrifice and just, you know, be total martyrs for their children and do everything for their children end up raising really helpless children and everybody is unhappy as opposed to mothers that set an example of what self-education looks like, of them loving to learn, of them trying to learn an instrument, of them trying to learn another language, of them trying to figure out technology. That that example of what tenacity looks like is very impactful on your kids, for sure. Exactly. Great. Well, and talking about having an impact, what habits do you feel like have been really influential or helpful to your personal life? My big, the, or <laughs> what? Sound funny. What habits do you have in your personal life that have been really <laughs> helpful for you to be successful? Maybe is how I should have framed the question. Yeah, I think, or like even like frame of mind is, and this is going to sound kind of funny, but to really lower my expectations of myself and of everybody around me, and assume that everybody is doing their best, and give them credit for that, and not be hard on ourselves as women and do what we can and be grateful that we we did that to try to just develop one new habit or trait and enjoy that for a while instead of pushing ourselves so hard all the time to achieve and do so much more. We really burn out. I've trained all of my staff. I, we talk about how it's really important that they, everybody has very low expectations of me. I do not remember dates or times or anything for meetings. If it's not on my calendar, do not expect me to be there. It's not going to happen. And not worrying about what am I forgetting right now has really freed me up. Trying to automate as much as I can in my life. That has been really huge. I just got the Amazon Dash buttons. Have you seen those? No, I haven't. It connects to your Amazon Prime account, and you tell it what laundry detergent that you want, and it's a little button that you actually stick on somewhere in your laundry room, and when you're running low, you push the button, and it's delivered to your house in two days with free shipping. Wow, I like this idea. awesome. (laughs) Yeah, and so it, like, eliminates the time that I have to, Transfer it to a list and then go to the store. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, there setting our whole family up on Google calendars and getting together and having a family council once a week and lining up calendars and menus and who's cooking on what night. He, um, it just makes it very simple. So getting systems in place that are very predictable has been one of the things that's really given me a lot of freedom to be able to spend time on, on other things and to really not stress about what am I forgetting? What am I not doing? What's not getting done? I, I love systems, but they have to go in one at a time. Yeah. And then every season, systems completely unravel, and you have to be totally open and okay for that <laughs> and be willing to reestablish them again. Just as, as long as there's a morning routine and an evening routine in place, everything else in the middle can kind of usually figure itself out. Yeah, ebb and flow type of thing. But, but I love, yeah. uh, I kind of want to go back and reiterate the mindset thing that you said, you know, was one of your number one things is that I think sometimes we have, we do have a really negative mindset of ourselves or, and if we do this much more, or if we do this much better, that we're going to somehow be a better person. But sometimes when we, we understand that, you know, we forget dates and times or whatever, that, if we have that understanding and kind of, like you said, lower that expectation, that does help us lead maybe a happier life. <laughs> maybe, yeah. You know, 
So you're not living, you know, at this, uh, trying to always reach this goal that maybe you feel like you're never going to get there. So, right. Great. So tell me, what are some long term goals that you have for yourself? And how is that going to work into the legacy that you hope to leave? Well, honestly, I'm, I don't really think it in terms of like my legacy or, you know, things that, that I'm doing to be remembered by as much as I want to think of what are the things that I'm getting started or the seeds that I'm planting that are going to leave the world a better place for me having been here. For example, setting up a lot of the courses and classes that we do, being able to really, one of our taglines with Navanis World School is bringing the world's best mentors right to your home being able to identify some people that have an amazing message. One of the classes that we have is, as I mentioned before, is a positive psychology class that Elizabeth Smart did. I wish I would have had those tools to get over things in life and the mental tools and to be able to move on and make the most of your life. Wow, I wish I had that when I was 14. And so it was important for me to, to get that for my kids. So identifying those people that have a really great message to share and putting a megaphone on it, which is what we can do by creating online courses and getting it out there. That's definitely a big part of it. And then with the economic development on the adult side as well. But one thing that I've learned is that plans change and where you're supposed to be at at different times, that, that changes. And a lot of times the things that we think, oh, this is it, this is my big thing, it's a stepping stone to something bigger that you can't quite imagine yet. And so staying open to, to what that is, and for me, honestly, not, not worrying so much. I, I don't worry about that, about what the, what the legacy is. I worry more about, like I said, the seeds that, the seeds that we're planting, because a lot of those things take off without us. Oh, I love that, too. Thank you so much for that. Well, before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice for our listeners? And then please give us your contact information, how our guests can get in touch with you. Yeah, so my contact information is just D Larson, D L A R S E N at Navanas dot com, and that's spelled N A V A N A S dot com. Uh, through the website, you know, there's a lot of answers and things like that there. Parting words: We're talking mostly to homeschool families here, right? Yeah. Yeah, I would say you're doing a great job. Be nicer to yourself. Have fun. Enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And don't worry so much about all the little things that you're trying to fit in every day. It, I know I used to want to smack people when they would talk to me when I had toddlers and they were like, enjoy them. It goes by so fast because it felt like it went by really slow because you're always waiting for that next phase in life. Just enjoy where you are. There's so much growth that can happen. You don't even have to get dressed every day. No, I'm just kidding. But no, not really. <laughs> that, that we're everybody's doing a much better job than they think they are and stop comparing yourself to everybody else. What a powerful message to leave with because it's definitely the encouragement that we don't hear and see in the rest of the world. So thank you for coming and sharing that with us. Again, Daniela's contact information is dlarson at navarnas.com. Am I saying that right? Navarnas.com. Right. All right. But however, we will be sure to link all that information that we discussed today on our website as well. So thank you so much, Daniela, for joining us and for helping light our minds on fire. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Daniela Larson, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of inspiring content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net. For more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 